Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Stuart Topgrid. I'm the National Officer for Nursing at the Trade Union Unison. Uh, really happy to have an opportunity to talk to you today about staff wellbeing in the NHS, the health service. Um, like I say, I'm the National Officer for Nursing, but I am a, a registered nurse myself as well. Um, Unison represents more than 450,000 members of staff in the NHS across the whole, whole of the UK in a number of different job roles. I feel like uh, before I begin, I have to very quickly explain the, the background to me here, which is very appropriate, I think, for talking about well-being. But um, we've recently moved house and this is what was previously the nursery room that has now become my office. So it wasn't my choice of decoration, but it is very stress relieving. Um, Talking about, about well-being, I've, I've realised when I started thinking about this subject that uh, I found myself becoming more anxious every afternoon around 4 or 5 p.m. And I started trying to figure out why that was. And I realised that that's because it's around about the time that the government publishes its daily statistics on COVID figures in the UK, on hospitalisations, case numbers, deaths. And I found I realised that every afternoon I was refreshing that page. I was holding my breath and I was worrying that I might see an uptick in cases or hospitalizations that might signal the beginning of another wave that might um, lead to um, the pressure on the health service that we saw before. I spent several weeks during both of the lockdowns working as a, as a volunteer registered nurse in intensive care. And while I by no means had as traumatic or frightening or a long drawn out uh, experience as the vast majority of the staff in the health service did, I personally dread the thought of having to go through that again, of going back into the, the PPE, trying to care for people sick with COVID under all the pressures that we had to work under. My partner as well works as an anaesthetist in intensive care. She's actually asleep in the, in the bedroom next to me, having come back from a night shift a few hours ago. Um, every morning she comes back, she, I need to talk to her about how she's feeling, how stressful she's found things. And, part, and even though she's incredibly dedicated and obviously committed to her work, she was telling me the other day that she didn't think she could manage to get through a, another experience like she has done in the last year, which obviously should be incredibly concerning for all of us. At Unison, we, we speak regularly to our members in the health service to try and understand how they're feeling, how their well-being is, how their mental health is. So how are people coping? We've heard a lot about this obviously already today. We asked the sample of our nursing family in Unison whether the staffing levels in their services were adequate enough to allow them to take their rest breaks and to leave their work on time at the end of the day only 20% of them said yes. We asked them whether poor staffing levels in their services contributed to them feeling anxious and experiencing stress. 63% of them agreed. Those questions we asked them at a forum for our nursing family in early March 2020, before we were actually hit by the COVID pandemic. And so while there's been a rightful and a well-merited focus on staff well-being and supporting people's mental health during the pandemic and in the recovery, it's very important that we don't forget just how many of our staff and colleagues in the NHS were struggling with their mental health and their well-being even before we um, experienced the, the pressures of the last year with COVID. Unison ran a, a mental health and well-being survey of, of our members last year um, in October and we had a, a response of around 14,000 members which gave us a really clear indication of how people were feeling and how their well-being was and the picture that we received was extremely worrying. And it's also important to remember at this point that the, the figures I'm about to talk you through came from October, so before the whole second wave, which was in many ways more devastating in, in, for people's mental health, having to go back through the experiences that they'd already, they'd already been through. Could I have the, the, my slides come up, please? So as I say, we surveyed over 14,000 people, almost half of whom told us that they hadn't coped well mentally during the pandemic. 77% of them had sought mental health support. In the majority, that was from friends, friends and family, but around 20% of them had sought professional support and 27% had used the wellbeing apps and mental health support that was available to them through the NHS. You can see some of the key elements of the feedback that we got from our members in that little panel on the right-hand side of my slide there. I think it's important to highlight at this point that we, that we need to bear in mind the impact on all health service staff across the NHS. While much of the focus publicly has been on intensive care, acute services and nurses and doctors, our survey also highlighted that lots of our members working in management roles or in roles which have gone virtual over the last year and are, who are working at home have also really struggled with their mental health. Lots of our members began their careers in, uh, in healthcare because they, they loved working with patients, they wanted to help people and they enjoyed that personal interaction that comes with that career. They're now facing up to a very different role. Some of them haven't seen a patient face to face in over a year and much about their future career looks uncertain at the moment. 
So it's obviously important that we, we think about catering to the health, to the mental health and well-being needs of all those different groups of staff. And as a union that represents staff in many, many different job roles across the health service, we'd also like to highlight repeatedly that, again, while much of the focus has been on doctors and on nurses during the pandemic, that the, the, um, the pressures of COVID have affected everybody in the health service, all of whom are obviously important in their job role to the, the functioning of the whole system and all of whom require individual support tailored to them. Can I have the next slide, please? Some of the, some of the other key findings of our report was um, the, the reasons why people were really struggling with their mental health. The fear of getting sick themselves was, was the highest reason. It's 60% people of people identifying that. 55% were um, feeling worse in terms of their well-being because they weren't able to socialize with family and friends. And also, obviously, an increased workload was a huge stress with around half of people reporting that was a contributor to their declining mental health. And you can see some of the quotes that we received back um, from members of the health service um, in, to our response on the right hand side there. I spoke to a number of nursing, represent, nursing representatives from Unison for an article that I wrote recently about the second wave. One of them was a, was a, a nurse from abroad who was working in intensive care um, in the same unit that I was working in. She told me that she hadn't been able to sleep properly for a month during the second wave. She was having nightmares where she woke up in the middle of the night worrying that she was stuck with a patient who was running out of NORAD and other critical medications that she couldn't replace and she couldn't get help. And obviously she was hugely affected by, by the, her experiences. Another nurse, a, a newly qualified nurse who's a friend of mine, um, began his career working in a specialist intensive care unit as a newly qualified nurse and found himself only two or three months later supervising whole teams of volunteers that were redeployed into ICU to help him care for patients at the time. He told me that, like, that he felt like a car running on empty was his words, that he'd never had time to refuel between the first and the second waves and he felt extremely stressed and anxious because of it. And during the time that I worked in intensive care in that second wave, a whole number of nurses told me that they were feeling like they would leave their jobs when the pandemic was over because in their words, they just couldn't, they couldn't face it anymore. And I'm sure everybody who's here today um, understands just how important or impossible it will be to replace extremely knowledgeable and skillful intensive care nurses once this is over. And can I have the next slide, please? It's also really important for us to acknowledge and to recognize, as a few of the speakers today have mentioned, that the impact in terms of mental health and well-being of the pandemic hasn't been shared equally. And actually, there's been a disproportionate impact on certain groups of staff. Our survey highlighted that black registered nurses in particular had been disproportionately impacted. While they made up 28% of respondents to our survey, 37% of, of them, sorry, they made up 37% of those who hadn't had their required risk assessment measures followed during the pandemic, which highlights that there's definitely an issue of um, inadequate support for those groups of staff. And also the fear of getting sick and financial worries were much higher for black staff than white staff in the responses to our survey. Thank you, you could, you could put the slides away now, thanks. So the key questions for us to consider then are how are we gonna support the, our workforce to recover from this emergency? Now getting to be the, the final speaker of the day means that there's obviously been a lot of really important recommendations and thoughts already given to, to you today, which I don't need to reiterate, but it also obviously means that I get to have the final say on our recommendations, which is a, a real privilege. Our aim has to be not just to return to the situation that we were in before the COVID pandemic hit us, before we were overwhelmed, to what was an era of unsafe staffing levels, annual winter crises that seemed to get worse and worse, and burnt out healthcare workers across the NHS. When we spoke to our members on mental health and wellbeing, over half of them told us that they wanted access to continuing support for their wellbeing and mental health once the pandemic was over. A third of them identified that counselling was particularly important for them, and around a third also stated that they, thought they felt like a, a, a mental health support line with trained staff would be extremely helpful. We know that a large number of NHS workers have been affected by long COVID and the long shadow of the pandemic in terms of their recovery and, and all the pressures that are going to come with that is going to hang over healthcare staff for a long, long time to come. And it's really, really vital that, that all NHS workers are able to count on support when they need it for as long as they need it. And after everything that we've asked of them during the pandemic over the last 18 months, it's so important that they don't feel like they've been abandoned once the pressures of, of the immediate pressures of the pandemic have passed. So at Unison, we want to see minimum standards for all health employers, such as availability of counselling with trained professionals and a support line that's available for staff around the clock. 
And it's also obviously really important to reiterate that all those staff that are finding themselves in a crisis point or struggling with their mental health are given paid time off to recover for as long as they need to. In terms of help in people's workplaces, despite the NHS saying a lot and, and insisting that every member of staff required a risk assessment during the, the, the pandemic, only 46% of our participants confirmed that their employer had completed an individual risk assessment with them. And so all the best specialist mental health support in the world can't make up for the, the lack of supportive, positive work environments and help around uh, our staff in the health service when they need it. Now this starts at the top of organizations, obviously with positive working relationships between NHS employers and trade unions. And together we should be working together to identify areas of concern and coming up with plans to help remedy them. It was interesting to hear from Professor Neil Greenberg earlier about the benefits that come from enabling line managers to check up on the well-being of their staff. But it's also, but it's obviously hugely important that those line managers have the space, the time, and the training to enable them to listen to their teams to tackle those problems and offer people the right support when they need it. By work that Unison have done, it has shown that often that's not the case. Our members who are line managers feel like they don't have the right skills to be able to do that. And often they don't have the protected time away from clinical duties to enable them to have that, that time to support their, their employees. And of course, we're filling up a leaky bucket unless we deal with the disastrous staffing shortages across the NHS that were so brutally exposed by the pandemic. In clinical practice, I was often stressed and anxious on a daily basis because of the fear of missing uh, a sick patient or of leaving some care undone or of not doing my job as well as I could have done. And we can't allow that to be the case going forward. We need to make the investment in recruitment, retention and planning of safe staffing levels to ensure that high quality care is possible in every circumstance that also enables people to maintain their well-being. And finally, our, our members and your employees will not feel valued until there is recognition of their work in the simplest way possible. We know that they've seen the value of their pay drop since 2010, and a quarter of our respondents told us that the pandemic had placed either themselves or their family in financial difficulty. And of that sample, 81% of them told us that that had affected their mental health negatively. The, the colleague of mine that was a newly qualified nurse in intensive care talked about this recently, and I'll, I'll quote what he told me. He said, you've done everything you can, you've put your life on the line, but at the end of the month, you look at your pay packet and you're struggling to make ends meet. I've questioned my job. What's the point if I can't look after my family? You can't advise nurses to seek help to look after their psychological well-being while ignoring their financial well-being. The indication of a 1% pay offer after everything that's happened over the last 10 months has been a really bitter blow to people's morale. Um, and it's so important that that is recognized by government as they deliberate on the final pay offer for the NHS in England. We're calling for an immediate significant pay rise that eases people's financial concerns, but also sends a really, really important message of how they're valued that will enable us to support their well-being and keep them in the NHS. And we obviously value all your support in making that argument. So I'll begin to wrap up. Um, finally, uh, to, to say that obviously I think this needs to be a, a turning point in how we value people who work in this health service and how we support their well-being. When our services are, are well-staffed, well-funded, fully managed, uh, properly managed, and staff are well-supported, roles working in the NHS can be rewarding and they can feel positive. My, my first role in the NHS was uh, as a nurse working in major trauma rehabilitation. Um, and I loved the job. I loved working as a team to put people back together again, to help them walk, to help them go on, to recover their lives. But too often as a nurse after that, and for all of my colleagues in the health service, their jobs don't feel like that every day. They make them feel stressed, insecure, anxious, and often afraid. We have to make it our mission that in five years, in 10 years, every morning and every night, when a nurse, healthcare assistant, porter, cleaner, technician, healthcare assistant, physiotherapist goes into or out of their workplace, they can do so smiling and feeling positive about their work. We need to ensure they feel supported to be well and that their desire to ensure high quality care doesn't mean that they have to sacrifice their own mental health and well-being to do that. Roles working in the NHS in, in our health service can and should be like that all the time. And it's going to take all of us working together to make that happen. Realistically, doing so is going to recover, require huge resources and it's going to require a really dramatic change. But the cost of not stepping up to that challenge is in, inconceivable. And after everything that we've been able to achieve together over the last year, um, there's absolutely no excuse for failing to meet that challenge or to rise to that challenge. 
So we look forward as a union to working with all of you to help meet that challenge in the coming years. Thank you very much. And I, I think I'm handing over to Matt to come in and wrap up today's event. Thank you. So I want to first off thank uh, Stuart for that. It was a really insightful conversation, briefly disappeared due to the choice of uh, technology, but glad that happened at the end. But ultimately, that brings it to a close of what has been a fantastic day of speakers, networking and collaboration all around well-being and welfare in our NHS staff. I want to extend thanks from everyone at NHE to our brilliant guests, but also personal thanks to the team behind the scenes who worked tirelessly to make sure this ship sailed as smoothly as it has done, especially when I briefly disappeared a second ago. Um, but as mentioned, from the beginning of today's show, all content from today's conference, as well as past events, will be available on demand shortly. Please feel free to stick around, take advantage of our meeting hub, stop, spark your own conversations, and check out the digital marketplace if you haven't already. From all of us here at NHE, thank you for joining us today. We hope that we've offered some great insights. I know certainly our guests have, and we'll see you at the next event. Thank you very much from myself and the rest of the team.